We're very fortunate to have with us today Tom Saki, the CEO of TerraCycle, who's going to talk in detail about the circular economy. And the first up, we're going to look at the role of recycling in closing the circular economy. So, Tom, there's a common misconception that certain kinds of products and packaging aren't recycled because they can't be. Could you explain the reality and why it's important that people understand that recycling is actually a business? It's a very, very good question. I think this is a great framing for the entire concept of uh, of recycling, which is really the, you know, honestly, the first step in moving uh, our current system into a circular economy. So while we look at alternative methods of filling like reuse or other things, recycling really is the pragmatic step that we have to do at scale that is in front of us as society today. And typically, if you look at consumers like citizens, the perception, I believe, is that recyclers are out there recycling what they can recycle, almost like a public service, like healthcare or education, you know, and, and doing what is right, and then, you know, funding that in perhaps taxes or some method of, uh, of such. That's really the citizen perception. The corporate uh, perception, if I think about brands and retailers, I would distill it to be, it's about the technical capability to recycle an object, like the R&D of the object. Is it possible to recycle it? And then is there available infrastructure to carry out that technical process? And I would argue that the real thing we have to focus on is neither of those assumptions, which is to say that, you know, recycling are for-profit businesses, you know, Veolia or Waste Management, these large organizations are for-profit companies whose mode or, 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 or entire goal is to serve profit to shareholders. And so what really gets recycled is not what is technically recyclable, which is, mind you, just about everything but what is profitable to recycle. And a good way to look at this metaphor is, let's say you and I ran a junk company, you know, and we had a truck and we were running around, you know, doing junk services. And uh, let's say we went to an estate where maybe someone had passed away and the uh, the heirs are asking us to clean out, you know, the estate. You know, there's a bunch of stuff that, you know, we think is garbage. We put it in our truck, but then we run into a Steinway piano. We would probably look at each other and say, you know what? We're not going to throw that out. We're going to take it and sell it, right? It is about extracting value from our waste. And if the cost of collection and processing is lower than the resulting value, we're going to extract it as waste management companies and go sell it. Now, the value can be subsidized through EPR or the volume, this extended product responsibility, or the which is a form of tax, if you will, or the volume can be grown through DRS, deposit return schemes. But net net, that is the everything to look at. If you then take that sort of mode and take a step back, what you realize is also there's been a lot of headwind, which is why recycling has been struggling over the past 10 years. You know, it's low oil prices have suppressed end market values for polymers. The end markets themselves have been much harder to access. You know, China and many other countries stop the importation of waste. And then also the quality of our waste vis-a-vis -vis how profitable it is for recyclers to bother recycling is diminishing because the entire goal of the packaging industry is to remove value, remove cost, right? Um, make things lighter, thinner from cheaper materials. And that is wonderful because it reduces cost, even reduces the need of materials. But then as a recycler, you look at this stuff and you say, well, there's even less value in it than there was before. So why bother, you know, sorting it, collecting it, processing it, and so on and so forth. And I think if we hone on this central question that recycling is all about, you know, uh, or what will be recycled is not about technical or infrastructure. It has to do with, can a garbage company make money? I think it really helps clarify the interventions we need to do and what we have to think about consistently. So how do the recyclers make money from that then? Because obviously what you're saying, I completely agree with, but how, like the whole process, how does it work? Yeah, absolutely. So if you simplify the recycler's business equation, you have the economics of collection. You have the economics of conversion or processing, turning the waste into a sellable form. And then you have what you sell that material for. So let's just do a quick double click on each of those. Collection. In collection, you have the cost of physically getting the waste from the point of origin, like a consumer's home, you know, sending a truck, picking it up. You have to take it to a facility, typically a MRF, a sorting center, and then you have to sort it into fractions that can be sold. In some cases, you get paid to do that, so there may be some revenue there, but nevertheless, you have that entire burden of getting the waste from the consumer to a sorting center and sorted. Then the second part is processing. Now, typically, the recycler itself or the, the collector may not be the processor. You know, they may then sell it to a processor uh, or move it to a processor. But then the processor, uh, whether it's the same company or a different company, takes that sorted material and shreds it, melts it, in some way processes it into what one would call like a new material or a material that a manufacturer can use. And that's the output that is then sold to a manufacturer who purchases it and then makes products using some percentage of recycled content. Now, so if we zoom out of that equation, there is revenue in the material sale, there is cost in the processing, 
and there's costs in the collection and sortation. Um, uh, and so that is the simplified business model, collection and processing versus value. Now, value is really subject to commodity prices, right? So oil, for example, has been low over the past five years, and oil is what plastic is made from. So when oil goes down, virgin plastic prices go down, and as such, the price that you can sell recycled plastics go down. So value is really subject to the commodity uh, fluctuations, if you will. And so this is where the, 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 the equation is sensitive, right? When oil prices go down, less things become recyclable because they become less profitable to bother recycling them. And there's relatively little input uh, or revenue inputs because you really just have the value of the material and maybe some subsidy through taxes or some subsidy through the municipality funding collection, which is many times why wealthier municipalities have recycling because they pay for it and less wealthy municipalities do not. Um, Jacksonville, Florida, just last week, canceled recycling uh, due to budget concerns. It seems that recycling rates have been stagnant for a long time now, over the yeah. past few years, and the recycling business has been challenging, to say the least. Yes. So does recycling still actually matter? It, it does, absolutely. Just because it's challenged doesn't, and the business construct is challenged does not make it less, less or more important, frankly. It just means we have to help recyclers greatly to do this very important work. Because it's critical, because today we live in an ostensibly disposable economy. We buy things, we use them for very short periods of time, and we dispose them. And so the most important thing in front of us in the in the immediate term, like what do we do tomorrow, is how do we collect this disposable stuff and make sure that we honor the materials they're made from so that we can make more stuff from them instead of extracting things from the earth. Because the number one environmental uh, uh, pressure we have in our entire sort of commerce environment is the act of extraction. Like if you look at LCA's life cycle analyses, it's always the farming, the mining, the extraction that is the majority of the impact on our planet. And if we dispose materials, either through landfilling or incinerating them, then we have to extract again. If we honor the materials by recycling them, then we reduce the need for extraction, which is why life cycle analyses show that recycling is typically 50 to 75 percent better for the environment from a carbon point of view than is, than is say, landfill or incineration, destruction outputs, right? Linear outputs. Mm -hmm. Now, so it's critically important. There's this, you know, sort of misconception, if you will, and I think, you know, that uh, that recyclers and waste management companies are somehow morally, you know, obligated to like do the right thing with the waste, right? Like that, you know, and, and I, th I think sort of, you know, we, we feel that, but they're not, right? They are there to serve their shareholders and make money. So they're really only going to collect and sort what they can make money at. And this is so important that we understand that we have to feed the garbage stream what recyclers want, not be like, hey, recycler, why aren't you recycling this object? Which they had no opinion on when it was created, right? So to, you know, to, here's a good example. In, in the UK, Tesco famously banned just a, a year or two ago the ability to sell biodegradable uh, packaging in their stores. They have banned it full out, right? Uh, very brave and did it very publicly. Other companies have done similar things, but very privately and quietly. But Tesco, to their credit, did it loudly. So then the question is, why? And this goes to the same fundamental question is, Biodegradable packaging is absolutely true. It will biodegrade, right? It is exactly as advertised in the right settings, industrial composting for industrially biodegradable or home if it's home, absolutely will do. There's no, there's no manipulation there. But composters in the UK don't want it. So if it's in, you know, if they receive it in their feedstock, they will sort it out and burn it. Yep. And why they do that is because it harms their business equation and doesn't help it. And this is the everything that we have to think about is it's not that the waste management industry is responsible to recycle everything we produce, is that we have to incentivize and make it uh, profitable for them to bother doing it. And we can do that by what we feed the waste, higher quality, valuable materials, or we can subsidize it, but we have to somehow create the money flows. So going on from that, what is the role of recycling in the circular economy? Yeah, it's I think if you think about the, 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 the first step from linear to circular, you know, linear is like take, make waste, right? Um, uh, in the first step of turning a linear system, because it's not just about inventing new systems, right? It's really about converting current systems from linear to be progressively more circular. And so in a take, make waste system, the most important thing is that when the object becomes waste, that instead of it being destroyed, it, that the material can be recovered, and that's exactly what recycling is. That's why it is ostensibly not a perfect solution, but the most important solution to scale today. No question. 
From there, we then need to go one step further uh, and think about how do we make sure that the companies are also a market for recycled content, not just making sure the object is recyclable, but that they're pulling and demanding recycled content mm -hmm. to make their products. And then when we have that going, that is a, recycling, a circular economy based on recycling, we need to challenge ourselves on how to tighten that circle and have fewer steps and less impact, which would be perhaps moving from disposable systems to reusable. And then it's important to keep the white elephant in the room, of course, which is none of this is the answer to fundamental sustainability. We, the, fun, the, the actual question we have to think about is then how do we modulate down our volume of consumption? Because... We, sh we shouldn't be mistaken that circular economy is not intrinsic sustainability. Circular economy just means that we are not producing waste and we are allowing the material to go around and around. But having any material go around, whether through recycling or through reuse or new models, is some level of impact. And so we also have to really think about how do we modulate our net impact downward by buying less. That is so important we don't lose sight of that because we can't circular economy our way into full sustainability where we're in balance with the world. Fantastic, thanks. And if, we, if we move more, Tom, onto the role of recycled content within closing the circular economy. Um, so if we move from the process of recycling to the materials it actually produces, what is the role of recycled content in closing the circular economy? We talked just earlier about this concept of like, is the object one makes recyclable, right? And that has to do with what we've already discussed. But what happens with that recycled material? And today in recycling, most of it would be what experts would call downcycling, right? It goes from a high quality material to a lower quality output. Pragmatically, that would be like turning a shopping bag that we maybe we drop off at our local supermarket into plastic lumber, which is where it goes. Now, that's that is recycling. It's really important. It's really good. But you're moving from a high grade material to a low or a high grade application to a lower grade application. Now, please note, you know, many times the word downcycling has super bad branding to it. Down, it feels negative and so on. So people many times like to sort of, you know, um, degrade it and say that it's not really recycling. But let's be clear. It is most of what recycling is. And all materials degrade to some degree. Paper is a wonderful example. Paper can go basically through seven cycles, right? Uh, because what happens every time you recycle it, the fiber length shortens. And so you can go from bright white paper to maybe corrugate to maybe newspaper to maybe toilet paper. And what happens is the fiber length keeps diminishing. And at some point you can't form paper again. Paper uh, would have about seven cycles uh, capable. Plastics, you know, maybe 15 to 30, you know, glass much more, alloys much more. But it always is somehow going in a downward direction. And so what is so important is that the companies that are especially are producing high grade outputs are pulling material. Right. And really focusing on how do we keep it at the highest grade application for as long as possible. And that has to do with demanding recycled content. Now, there is a white elephant in the room here. Right. Uh, as in many of these topics. Right. Which is that in recycled content, everyone out there has made these incredible pledges that are due in 2025. Right. I mean, that's three years from now. And by the way, massive headwind to the recycling industry during this whole time, you know, low oil prices, things we already talked about and, and markets and whatnot. The total amount of demand that is stated for a material type like PET, like a soda bottle, you know, uh, substrate, is 10 times the available supply today. And the supply is not dramatically increasing. And the reason there's this huge delta between demand or stated demand and supply is because we are all hunting for or all the manufacturers are hunting for the same material, which is recycled content that behaves characteristically in price and, price and performance like virgin content. Mm -hmm. So, and this is because we design our products from a virgin mentality, right? What, what that sort of means, if I'm making a shampoo bottle for a company, I'm going to figure out how to make the coolest, uh, most amazing shampoo bottle from virgin plastic, because that's how every designer does it, you know? And think about the characteristics, like how thick it can be, how well it can squeeze, what the price is. And then my company wakes up, as many have, you know, wonderfully, and says, now I need to make that same shampoo bottle from recycled material. Well, I already have my molds, my run times, and all this stuff, so I'm now going to look for recycled content that I can plug and play into the mold that I made, you know, thinking of what virgin plastics can do. And that, what that restricts me to, say in the world of PET, is soda bottles and water bottles only, because those are clear, those are food grade, and those are collected, you know, through councils and municipalities, which means that they have a favorable price. But I'm not touching all the other stuff out there, like not even close. So if I'm a shampoo bottle manufacturer and I'm using 100% PCR, you know, post-consumer recycled content, 
I'm using beverage bottles. I'm not using shampoo bottles to do that. And the same if I'm making a backpack out of PET or a carpet or uh, you name it. And so what we really have to think about as we demand recycled content, back to your original question here is, we need to not just say, give me PCR that is equivalent to Virgin, which is what we're doing today, but how do we design products and packages into the undesirable materials? And that is amazing because then a broader demand spectrum would appear for recyclers and that would increase the amount of stuff that they can sell, which of course goes back to the very first point, which is it improves their business equation. Following on from what you're saying with the PCR and the products, are enough producers meeting commitments that they've made to include more PCR in their products? It's yeah, it's a very good question. And I would say first, you know, the positive. It's incredible the amount of leaning in and commitments producers have made. And I really believe these are authentic commitments, you know, like they really intend to do them. And this is not just, you know, window dressing. Um, and it's really important to honor that intention. With that said, it's going to be very challenging for all the producers to meet their commitments, simply because if if uh, we're all everyone is focused on pulling the same material, it doesn't matter even if recycling improves, which is it's more stagnating, there's simply not enough to do it. So it's not possible in today's construct for all the producers to meet their commitments. And we're already seeing this from the major producers that they're struggling greatly getting their hands on the materials, right? They have to start thinking about doing procurement in the way they never have before, which is buying futures, you know, locking up supply chains for a long time. Now the producers that do that and change their procurement practices and really buy into the future, they will lock it up. And then everyone else is going to wake up in a world where there's no availability. And, you know, we, then you have to start thinking about what happens with counterfeit recycled content, because how do you actually even tell if that material you ordered is recycled um, post-consumer or pre-consumer or recycled at all? And again, the big unlock is, let's say, personal care company needs to be using personal care waste to make their products, not beverage waste. Uh, backpack companies or t-shirt companies who make, you know, our pet fabric need to be using textile waste to make those products, right? It would be then it could balance, but but that's not happening right now. It's all pointing towards the beverage industry being the input for everyone's recycled material. And so it can't possibly get the volumes that are needed. So that being said, Tom, are there any other materials out there um, with the same properties as PCR, which could be used instead? So, so yes, right, but the characteristics and the economics, so characteristics being like material characteristics, like what color comes out at the end, uh, what can it be made into and so on, are different and require very different and I think courageous design, right? Like it, it's not going to be at the beginning, it's going to be like, gosh, I have to make this wonderful gourmet, you know, uh, meal out of out of slop, right? Like that's how it's going to feel to, and it's going to be more expensive, right? Like think, here, here's a good example. Take, you know, clothing, right? Today, mo the majority, I think it's around 60% of the clothing in the world are hybrids, right? Polymers hybridized with natural materials, like a stretchy t-shirt is some cotton and like, let's say nylons or some other form of, you know, material. Now, could you, you know, get say recycled nylon, right? You can, but you have to start with a pure nylon source. But then that t-shirt, when it hits its end of life, is not deconstructed back into a new t-shirt. Do you see the issue, right? It then means that the, the apparel industry cannot be its own recycled input source. They have to pull from other industries. And as long as this happens, you get a fundamental imbalance. Ter TerraCycle has also become known as a leader in the reuse movement. So could you tell us a bit about Loop? I say this as a recycling company where TerraCycle's first two major divisions are collection and recycling, typically of hard to recycle materials like you know, everything from cosmetics to diapers and helping companies integrate recycled content into their products, what we've been sort of chatting about now. Now that gets us to a circular economy based on recycling. That's a relatively big loop. And there are some of the challenges I described vis-a-vis -vis downcycling or you know, the material moving through industries, but not staying necessarily in the same loop. So if you looked at a recycling loop in a two-dimensional form, it would look like a circle. But I would argue that you would want to actually rotate it on the third axis and into a third dimension. And then it looks like a corkscrew, right? In other words, as it goes around, it doesn't go back into itself. Like it starts here, it goes around and it's here now. Then it goes around and it's here now. And that's what we mean about this sort of moving through industries or downcycling or, or whatever um, uh, a synonym we may want to put against it. So we thought a lot about, well, that clearly is not the fundamental answer to waste, right? It's, it's what has to scale today. No question. 
but it's not the fundamental answer. And that sort of led us to, well, what is the root cause of waste? And we landed on the hypothesis that it's the concept of a throwaway culture, disposability, single use, you know, this sort of thing. And this is a new concept, right? It's so important to honor that it's only around since the 1950s. There's people, you know, who are, let's say, our grandparents who lived in a world or born in a world where we cobbled our shoes and mended our clothes, you know, bought milk from the proverbial milkman and lived you know, in a world where we valued these things and they kept getting reset, repaired, refreshed, cleaned, you know, those sort of things. And we didn't really have waste in the way we have it today. I mean, really, if you look at waste, it's a 1950s invention and it's exploded since then. OK, so if disposability or single use is the issue, then we did a lot of research and wondering, well, what does the reuse movement really need? Right, because there is wonderful companies that are coming up with refill stations, and uh, you know, you get a bottle at home, and then you get concentrate and you fill it. Right, there's lots of that happening. So another one of those, I'm not sure, is going to really create um, a fundamental shift. But what we realized is that in the world of reuse, there's a challenge right now, which is that all the ways you can experience reuse are what one would call mono supply chains. Here in the U.S., my propane tank for my barbecue is reusable. Right, it doesn't get thrown out; it just gets refilled with propane. A beer keg that I may also buy for my barbecue is reusable. It'll be a wonderful barbecue, mind you, you know, um, is reusable. It's steel. It's great. It just gets cleaned and filled up with new beer. But when those two objects are empty, I can't take the propane tank to the beer store and I can't take the beer keg to the propane tank place. I have to stay in my lane. Yeah. Just like refill stations are, you know, once I buy a bottle, I have to go back to that store, refill it with that brand's content, right? They're very what one would call mono supply chains which makes them inherently unscalable in, you know, if you wanted to live your life with thousands of products, right? Because how can you remember where thousands of products, you know, have to go? And it's what's beautiful. I think we can, you know, we uh, can vilify disposability a lot, but it did win, right? We vote for it every day. So let's honor why do we vote for it? And I'd argue it's because it's epically convenient and it's cheap. And these are important virtues to honor if we're going to somehow beat disposability and shift people because those virtues have to be met. And so what Loop is all about is trying to be a platform for reuse where any brand can enter and create a reusable version of their product. And then any retailer, whether it's McDonald's or Tesco, can sell those products, whatever is, of course, appropriate to their consumers. And then most importantly, a consumer can buy anywhere and return anywhere. So today you can go to a Tesco in the UK and select stores and buy, say, your Priscilla laundry detergent in a reusable package filled, ready to go, have a completely disposable experience. When it's empty, just chuck it, but chuck it back into a loop ecosystem or a reuse bin and throw it not back at a Tesco, but maybe at a McDonald's, right? Because today your recycling bin doesn't really care where you purchase the product. It just cares it's recyclable. But it's not going to say, oh, you bought it at Asda and this is a Tesco only, you know, recycling bin, right? Um, there's no way that would work. And so that's what Loop is really trying to achieve is to be that platform uh, that sort of allows the uh, all these reusable systems to work interconnectedly and to make it really easy to scale because we believe in what we've learned, you know, in three years of now doing this is convenience is everything. It's a yep. gate. If you are not convenient, you don't even get to tell you the consumer about what the features and benefits are and at what price. Right. So you know how people always ask uh, this proverbial question in sustainability, like, will someone pay more for an organic you know, product? Yeah, I think it's an incorrect question because I would first say, is the convenience of buying that product equal or better than the alternative? If it is, I go to the next question, which is what are the features and benefits? And then then I ask, are those reasonably priced? And that's what we have to really win on in reuse to to allow it to compete with disposability and start taking share. So are there any factors which would influence companies not to use these reuse methods? Yes, there is a big issue in any new system coming out. What is a consumer comparing a reusable product to? So let's take that Persil bottle, right? If you're going to walk into Tesco, you can buy Persil in a disposable package at a certain price. And now you can buy it in a reusable one. It's the same juice inside. Now, maybe you'd argue the reusable package is, slight, is more eco-friendly. That's a plus. Maybe it's more beautiful. It's now stainless steel. I'd argue it's actually gorgeous and wonderful, right? So those are pluses. But you're going to pay only so much more for that, right? And in Tesco, they've even done a, a thing where it's going to be the same price. It's a reuse price guarantee. Now, the disposable pack is like an Olympic athlete as it comes to efficiency, right? It's honed. It's, uh, it's big mass production. It's as cheap as you can make that object appear. Reuse is low scale. And low scale comes with high cost. And so 
you have there that means that the brands, the retailer, Loop itself has to invest huge amounts of money to to be able to render it to today to the consumer at a low price. Now, volume is the solution to all of that, right? As volume comes, the prices collapse and uh, reuse can become price competitive to disposability, evidenced by it is the beverage industry in Germany. It is the beer industry in Canada, right? So at scale, it's not a hypothesis. It does get competitive, but you got to get to the scale. And how do you get to the scale is retailers leaning in and, you know, putting this in their stores, brands leaning in and putting products on the shelf and not saying, well, I like it. I want to join, but I let, call me when you're at scale because then you never get there. And right. that's the big dance that Loop is playing, you know, with the brands and the retailers is making sure we can get enough folks who believe and lean in and 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 help effectively finance the ability to get to scale, at which point everything normalizes, everyone can make money and it can really head to head compete with uh, disposability. And frankly, it's exactly the same journey the organic food movement did. I mean, Loop's closest proxy is the concept of organic, right? Because organic went around, convinced people to farm differently, which at the beginning was extremely expensive and cumbersome. And then yeah. retailers created organic sections in their stores. That's how it began. It's exactly the same thing with Loop. And then as scale came down, the cost of organic went down. And there's now some retailers who only sell organic goods, right? And it tipped over. Yeah. Um, but that's sort of the closest idea of what uh, Loop is trying to achieve. Now, are there any industries where it's harder to reuse packaging. So interesting. I, I would frame it differently if I may. It's not that it's harder or, or easier. What I found with consumer product companies, uh, and we work with all of them, right, from motor oil to perfume to beverage food in loop, it's less so about can it be done. It's more so how much intrinsic comfort they have with it. So what I mean by that is take a, a company like Nestle, right? They already do reusable beverage containers uh, with mm -hmm. their water business in some countries. So there's an organization that like it gets it. What does that mean is that it makes it more confident for their baby food division, their pet division, you know, to feel confident that they can get there because internally they can call up internal stakeholders and be like, how do you do Perrier reusable in uh in, uh, uh, let's say, Germany, and they go, well, exactly, here's how it works, here's what's, and then, then they get all the confidence. Then you move over to, let's say, a company that is new to reuse, like Procter & Gamble, right? They've, they, they have no business units today that are in reusable and no history of it either, right? So either you have to have a history on it, like many of the beverage players, or active business to create that um, internal comfort and internal sort of uh, know-how. But if you don't, then it's going to seem much more foreign. And uh, it just takes longer to get folks across the finish line, right? Like, and it's not just, you know, the, what does the pack look like? How do you fill it? How do you look at the health and safety? How do you look at the economics, right? There's all the stakeholders have to be brought along. And so that's the real difference we see in consumer pro product companies is in the end, look, we're putting stuff in a bottle. It's not landing someone on the moon, right? Uh, and so it's very doable. But the question is this, uh, how lubricated is the process? And that is entirely connected to um, historical comfort or active comfort. Fantastic. One final question, Tom. Yeah. Um, what would you say are the biggest barriers to shifting away from a linear disposable supply chain and into a more revolutionary circular one? What are the biggest hurdles to overcome? Convenience and inertia are the two that come immediately to my mind. So convenience is not just convenience to the consumer. Right. And that has to be put on a pedestal and honored and really aimed towards. And to me, in reuse, that would be uh, or even just recycling. Make it easy. Make it ideally as easy as throwing it in the rubbish. Right. Mm -hmm. That's to the, the consumer. But it also has to be easy to the other stakeholders, which are the brands and the retailers. I, I give you an example in Loop. One of the virtues of Loop uh, uh, has been we've tried to do that with with uh, the brands and the retailers, and it's why it's been easier for retailers to scale. I and mean, that's what they've told us is like if you walk into a Carrefour or a Tesco and you see the Loop section, it looks normal. It's just stuff in a package. Just the package is different, which means if they want to add more stores, their supply chains are already set to handle that very well. If they were trying to scale, let's say, another method of reuse, refill stations, they'd have to implement this whole new concept of infrastructure. You know, run power all over the place, put in these uh, more, you know, a whole different method of thinking where you have to train your staff, do things differently, manage inventory differently. You can imagine all the all the different details. So it that makes it inconvenient uh, to the process. Okay. And convenience is so important because it solves inertia. Right. In the end, everyone would prefer to, you know, to, to make life easy and just do tomorrow what we do today. That's not a malicious thing. Right. It's not about, well, I don't want to be better. It's entirely linked to, I want it easy. 
right? Yeah, of course. Uh, and companies want it easy. People want it easy. Everyone loves convenience. And so when you ask for change, it's, you know, it's the proverbial shifting a cruise ship, you know, or a big tanker going in a different direction. It's not about how do you make the shift? How do you like sort of, you know, do your song and dance to get the shift to occur? But how do you make the actual turning the boat as little as possible while creating the biggest net effect? That's actually much. So it's not about how do we turn the big boat fast? It does not turn fast. It's about how do you turn it one degree, but accomplish a huge difference. Right. Uh, that is actually the secret sauce to this. Then somehow some magic on how do you get the boat to suddenly go 90 degrees in the opposite direction? Uh, it just won't. It just will not happen. And so there again, I think the thing is. It's not about behavior change, right? You know, many times in sustainability, we talk about we have to have whole new behaviors. Um, that's incredibly difficult. That's turning it, you know, 180 degrees, right? Uh, whether a consumer or whatever, or a whole, whole, whole new method of filling and distributing. Those are monster changes. I would argue, how do we make it feel disposable while acting reusable? Well, Tom, thank you so much for your time today. No, it's my pleasure. Fantastic. Yeah, thank Have a you so day, much Tom. for your thank time. You. It's been brilliant and very informative. Thank you. Absolutely.